Hi everyone, it's Amy here from the blog I Think Therefore I Teach. Welcome to our next philosophy video. This one is going to cover the topic of soul, mind and body. So let me make myself smaller. There we go. Fabulous. So this is for philosophical language and thought, soul, mind and body. Now, this topic is the third topic I cover with my first year students, once known Plato and Aristotle. It's probably one of the more complicated topics. It's certainly a complicated one to do early on in the course because it's very layered. There's a lot of new names and new people. What you need to remember is that these names and these people come up throughout the course so whilst it's all very new to you now it will get easier as we go through but definitely do think of this one as quite a tricky topic so the first thing I get my students to do is I introduce them to Aquinas and some are theological he says my soul is not me and I get the students to discuss what do they think he means by this and I lead this into then saying what are your views on a soul do you think a soul exists and in what way we then move on to a set of discussion questions i get my students to think about and talk uh, with me and the class does a body make you human so is it a body that makes you human is it your consciousness or awareness that makes you human or is it a soul and my class really got involved with these questions and we're discussing all sorts of different things from uh, robots to being in jars you know like a brain in a jar to people that are in vegetative states they still have a body um, are they still human are they still a person we talked about animals so it really brings out a lot of ideas and understandings from these three questions uh, we go into this so if your question to answer number one was yes that you think it's a body what happens if you lose part of that body such as a leg does that mean you are no longer a person or does it mean you are even more of a human if you put on weight so more body so if you class body as human then what happens if your body lessens or greatens does that mean you are less of a human or more than a human if it is a consciousness and awareness that you think, then does this mean that a six month old you or a six month old baby is not a human? They don't have the same consciousness or awareness of a, you know, a toddler, a child, an adult, or that you are more human now because of your consciousness. And what happens if you get dementia and then you lose your memory? So are you still that same human being? So if it is consciousness that makes you human, what happens again if you don't have as far developed consciousness or if you lose that consciousness and finally if you think it's a soul then what is a soul uh, is it a special substance is it a something or is it some sort of spiritual aspect of who you are um, are we just searching for something that goes with the word and name soul or did we just put the name to something we cannot find what that means is is did we create the word soul and now we're trying to find something that fits that word or did we put the term soul to something that we don't quite yet know about and we're just waiting to find out uh, what it is? So it kind of is where did the idea of a soul or the word come from? The key words for this topic then, uh, dualism. This is a belief that there are two separate elements, body, soul. Think of dual meaning two. Substance dualism means there's two elements, body and soul, but they're the wholly separate and different substances. The psyche is the Greek word for mind and soul. Materialism, it believes that there is a substance, a material. Monism is the idea that there is one substance, not two. Reductionism is a criticism of something. Reductionism is when everything can be reduced to statements about physical bodies. So reductionism actually can be used as a criticism in a lot of arguments if you if you think they reduce their conclusions down to, to far simpler ideas. So reductionism is exactly as it sounds on the tin. You are reducing something down. And is the end outcome a worthy solution or do you think actually it makes things just too simplistic? And then behaviourism, the idea that mental states are simply learned behaviours. 
So starting with common ground, somebody that we are we know and that we are now familiar with is Plato. Plato sought something permanent and certain. So obviously the river quad, everything in this world changes, Plato's world of forms, etc. From here, he said that if permanence cannot be found in this material world um, around us, there must be another world. And therefore, it's the soul that experiences this other world. Our soul is immortal. It lives forever. It's no beginning and no end. And it's what experiences this world of forms of true knowledge and true understanding. Therefore, the soul is the essential and immaterial part of a human. Sorry, just waiting for my computer to catch up. Or go completely. Fabulous. He describes the soul in his book Fuido. So Fuido is the name of one of his books. He describes it as divine, intelligible, meaning you can understand it, uniform, constant, um, indissolvable, meaning permanent, you cannot dissolve it, unchangeable, eternal, perfect and immortal. And so I introduced my students to two new words here, disembodied and embodied. Disembodied means dis, not, m in, bodied, body. So it's a not in body argument and an in body argument. So I get them to try and remember the world of forms and how that might be possible. How is the soul both not in body and in body? Be very careful if you do talk about this in an exam that you don't put out of body. Out of body is very different. You can still be alive when it's out of body. Not in body means body has died. And so obviously the answer is, is that the soul goes to the Noah Tom and the soul goes to the other world. It's disembodied. It has no physical form or physical body when it goes to the Noah Tom. Whereas when the soul is re born that metempsychosis or reincarnation it's back into an embodied existence after death. so it's died once soul's disembodied goes to the noah tongue comes back into a new physical body it's therefore once again embodied it's in body back in this uh in this world again and there are three parts to the soul for Plato. The first is rational. This is your intellect, your thinking, your truth seeking. It's the one that's in control of the other elements. You have the spirited, which is your wills, your virtues, um, your kind of your personality traits. And your repetitive sounds very much like appetite. It's the appetites of the body. It's the body's needs, things like um, greed, so food, drink, reproduction. He takes it one step further in his book Fuidrus. So Fuidro and Fuidrus are two different books. And he takes it one step further into um, the idea of the charioteer. And this is a really good, um, uh, it's not quite an analogy, a metaphor to use in your essays. So what he's saying is this is the charioteer is the rational element of the soul. It's the one in control, the one in charge, like a, a charioteer in, in charge of his chariot. The white horse is the spirited element, um, such as courage. And this leads the rational up with the soul, up to the noaton. So the soul, um, the white horse and the charioteer go to the noaton. What happens to the black horse? The black horse dies because it's linked with the body, the body's appetites and needs. The appetitive or the black horse dies. So the black horse dies with the appetitive part of the soul. The white horse and the soul and the rational and then free to go to the world of the noaton in order to experience that full and truth and understanding. This is a really, really good argument in the sense that it's good to show personality traits. And this is something that inspires Freud. Uh, so the psychologist Freud, this is very inspirational to him. So imagine a charioteer in charge of the two white horses, you're repetitive and you're rational, um, repetitive and spirited, sorry. It shows your personality. If you're really uptight, um, you know, uh, everything structured and very controlled, then your charioteer and your rational are way too 
tightly strung they're way too pulled up if you're instead you're black horse and um, somebody you might know is very um, greedy or sleeps all the time always wanting food or you know bodily pleasures their black horse is way out of control or if you're white horse um, and it's all about your virtues and spirited etc then their white horse is too out of control when your balance of your soul is perfectly in line you trot along happily and everything's quite mellow and measured so this really inspires future thinkers into the way that our personality is formed now as we know plato is extremely negative about the body um, the body is linked with this world the horaton and um, the body is the source of endless trouble great quote it's a burden it's a hindrance he is so negative about the body and he gives four reasons why other than the fact that it is the prison for our souls four reasons why he just has complete disdain for the body the first is that it just constantly requires food we don't think we can't function when we're hungry or think about if you've had a huge lunch or a big sunday after afternoon roast dinner then all you want to do is sit on the sofa and sleep and so it, it constantly holds back your soul from that quest for knowledge it's also filled with food feels and uh, fears sorry an endless foolery that when you're scared or frightened uh, you're going to fight or flight mode don't you? you can't think straight or think properly it's always diseased illness calls flus it's constantly the physical body is constantly holding back the soul uh, from finding out the true knowledge and then it's filled with loves and lusts that when you're in love or when you're heartbroken again constantly is a distracting element so the body constantly distracts us it's endless trouble and it takes away from us all power of thinking at all and as i said he does link it to the idea of the cave or a prison the soul wants to be free of empiricism and illusion this ignorance and our icasia and be free to experience the forms and true knowledge the body is our prison to the soul just as the cave was the prison in the analogy hop back to the previous videos on plato if any of that doesn't make sense to you so what are the strengths and of Plato? It's been a major influence on Christian thought, immortality of the soul. Noaton and heaven are quite similar. Be very careful though when you are looking for the strengths of Plato, just because Christianity supports it, or just because Noaton and heaven are similar, it's not necessarily a strength. Um, you know, just because another uh, group um, of people believe in something similar doesn't mean it's still correct or right. It just means that it's not as unusual an idea uh, because there are other people that support similar views. Later ideas of reincarnation, similar to Eastern religious uh, notions of rebirth. And then, as I said, it does link to Freud's id, ego and superego, so it shows about the individuality of people. Weaknesses, however, now this for me is a huge glaring problem, so I'll just put it all up there. The black horse is the problem. If the black horse, or we have an appetitive part of our souls that's linked to bodily needs... Uh, what happens to the soul then if it loses one third of itself every time the body dies? If the black horse dies, taking with it the appetitive part of the soul, how can we then be a full soul? We're only two thirds of the soul idea. Maybe that can be explained, but then the other question is, then if the soul is perfect and unchanging, how again can it avoid that? If it constantly loses a part of itself with the black horse or the idea of the appetitive part linked to the body and dying, while the white horse and the rational go up to the noaton, it doesn't quite make sense for an unchanging perfect soul. And so this raises the question of personal identity. Who is the person before when you're alive? Who is the person after? Or who is the soul after? Who really is that soul going to the noaton if you've lost part of yourself? We then bring Descartes into the mix. Descartes, I am a huge, huge fan of Descartes. I have very, very fond memories of learning Descartes at university um, and really enjoying uh, this part of the course. We spent a long time on Descartes. We spent a good half a term going through just some very basic parts of Descartes and really taking them apart so he's classed as a substance dualist he wrote many books including meditations and the passions of the soul he starts by asking this question is there any knowledge so certain that no one may doubt it so don't forget he's a rationalist or so everything's up here what he's meaning there is that is there anything that we can be so absolutely certain of, 100% certain of, 
And he says that everything that we get from our sense experiences could be mistaken. Senses can easily be misled, hence again he is a supporter of Plato. And so this means that the material world, everything we experience, even our own bodies, might not be real. They might be an illusion. Can you really be certain of them if it's based on knowledge from senses? So he concluded there is one certain piece of knowledge, the cogito. Cogito meaning the thinking mind. And from this you get the very famous quote, I think therefore I am. And so this idea is you are, the only thing you are 100% certain of is your own thinking mind. I'm aware of my own consciousness. I'm aware of my own mind. I'm aware of what's going on in my own head. But I, I don't know what's going on in your head. I don't know what you're thinking. When I'm teaching this to a class full of students, I don't know what they're thinking. So do I really know that they are even there? Do I really know that they exist? And so, because at the end of the day, it's my senses, it's my eyes saying, well, that student is there. It's my sense of touch that's saying that they're there or, or whatever it might be. That it's my senses that tell them that they are in the class. Uh, not my thinking mind. I cannot, I do not know what they're thinking. They're do, therefore, do I really know that they exist? And so, with that idea, you don't need to know it for this level, but at university, we went as far to even argue that do we know that we're still not dreaming? The film, um, oh goodness, what's it called? Inception, the film Inception with Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, quite an old one now for, for you lot, but I do highly recommend it. It plays around with the idea of dream worlds and it's very dark, dark Descartes, it's very Descartian. Cartesian, there we go, it's very Cartesian, um, based on these ideas. So it's looking at, do you actually even know that you are awake? Do you know that this isn't all just a dream? When I'm teaching this in front of a class, how do I know that that class is uh, is even there, is real? Uh, because all I'm aware of is my own thinking mind. So you really just take it to another level and kind of leads to a bit of an existential crisis where you think, actually, is this just none of it real? Is this all still a dream? Am I still dreaming? Why I'd be dreaming about doing this right now, I don't know, but that's what he argues. This means the body and soul are wholly separate substances. There is a very great difference between a mind and a body, because a body is by nature divisible, can be divided, but the mind is not. Another limb was amputated from my body, nothing would be taken from my mind. And that's in meditation six. So what he's saying there is that you can take away from the body constantly, but your mind is still whole. Or according to him, that's what he believes. And so he believes that your body can be affected, but your mind stays the same. If you want to disagree with him, then that's all well and good and that's very good because that's then your evaluation and your line of argument. Because some people might argue that actually your body and your mind are very closely linked. So for example, love. Love can be seen as a as something that you, you feel inside that's part of your soul, but you can also physically feel love. Um, or there's other examples of, of um, I give the example later on in this, about um, people with amputated limbs or phantom limbs. Their, their, their body is missing, but their mind still thinks it's there and they still get like itchy feet and stuff like that if they're missing a leg. And so that still means that there's some connection there, but that would be a weakness against him, so he does not believe that. All right, moving into Gilbert Ryle. Gilbert Ryle territory. He, he proposes the criticism against dualism of the category mistake. Now, I really like this argument. Students often find it really difficult to get their heads around, whereas don't overcomplicate this. So a category mistake is exactly as it says on the tin. It's where you put something in the wrong category. So you make a category mistake. It's mistakenly treating something as being of one thing or one type when it's of a different type. So he talks about this in his book, The Concept of Mind, and he uses the term ghost in the machine to criticise how Descartes describes his concept of the mind. So this is mainly going against Descartes. 
And the ghost in the machine argument is basically like me saying, I have a ghost inside my computer. So my computer sat in front of me. Now there is a ghost inside it. And the computer's the machine and there's a ghost living inside it. You'd think Amy's finally lost the plot, gone completely cuckoo. Of course there's no ghost in her machine. And he's arguing that that is as logical as me saying there is a soul, ghost, inside my body, machine. He says it's about as logical as saying there's a ghost in my machine as saying there's a soul inside my body. Descartes describes the mind as the pilot of the body and the body itself as some sort of mechanism. So again, the mind is in control or piloting the body and he says that's a category error, a category mistake. To be clear at this point, Gilbert Ryle is not presenting his own argument. He's not saying where he falls himself as far as this argument is concerned. He's just saying why dualism does not work, why Descartes' argument does not work. He is not attempting to create an alternative theory, but providing conceptual clarity. Lovely two words. Conceptual just means a concept. Clarity, make clearer. He's just trying to make a concept clearer. That concept being that body and soul are not separate and that by putting them in separate categories you are making a mistake. He gives three examples to help with this. Now you don't need to know all three of them. One would be perfectly fine for an essay. But I give all three to my students so you can pick which one they like the most. The first is Cambridge University. A foreign visitor goes to the different colleges, libraries, museums and then asks, well, where is the university? That's a category mistake. The university is the collection of all of those things, the colleges, the libraries and the museums, not just one certain building. So with many of your Russell Group universities or your top universities, Cambridge, Oxford, Durham, for example, Edinburgh, they don't just have one university building. They will have many colleges that are linked. These colleges have their own libraries. Each of the young campuses has their own libraries. And so there is no such thing as the university as one building. It's a collection of lots of different places. So what this is saying is it's not one thing, it's lots of things. A boy watches a military parade with the squadrons, platoons, batteries and asks, when will the division arrive? This again is a category mistake. The units make up the division. So again, it's not a separate thing. It's the collection of what is there. A foreign visitor watches a cricket match and with the bale stumps umpires and asks, where is the team spirit? Again, this is a category mistake as the collective game makes up the team spirit. So he thinks that's a separate category. Team spirit is a separate category. Division is a separate category. The university is a separate category. And it's not. It's that everything else collected together. So where he's going with this is, is that Descartes talks about the mechanism and body and the pilot as a separate category. And he's saying, no, that soul, that pilot, is just part of the same category. They're not separate categories. By putting them in a separate category, you're making a category mistake. The example I give to my students is uh, college. If Ofsted came to our college, for example, and saw the teacher, spoke to the students, saw the different areas, saw our uh, canteen, our drama department, etc., and then said, where's your, um, what word do I use? Where's your college ethos? No, the college ethos is not a separate thing. It's the collection of everything they see and experience. My students, I got my students to try and come up with some examples and I got some fantastic examples from students uh, this year. I'm just trying to remember... I, one of them that I do remember was um, you see the drummer, the singer, the guitarist and then say, where's the band? I don't know if that was the punchline, where's the band, or if it was something else, but you get the idea. So it's when you try and create a different category for something, when it's part of the whole. A soul in a separate category, no, it's part of the whole. There is not a separate category for the soul. In the same way, Descartes is guilty of a category mistake. Descartes assumes that things we experience are either physical or mental, but instead, according to Ryle, they are both. E.g., feelings are experienced by physical, by us physically and mentally, such as post-traumatic stress disorder. So you can you can physically feel anxious, and then you can have a panic attack. So you have it inside and you have it bodily, so mental and body. In other words, Ryle is arguing the imp it's improper to separate the two, body and soul. 
We then bring Mr. Peter Geach onto the scene. Um, he criticises dualism as well. So his place in this topic is not a materialist, it's not a um, somebody that looks at anything material. He is just simply criticising once more dualism. He questions, first of all, how can a disembodied soul see the forms? How does it see things when seeing is linked to the body and senses? That's not a quote, by the way, it's just taken uh, from things that he's said. However, this is a quote, and it's a quote I love, and me and my students spend a long time taking this apart. He says, It is a savage superstition to suppose that a man consists of two pieces, body and soul, which come apart at death. The superstition is not mended but aggravated by conceptual confusion if the soul piece is supposed to be immaterial. The genius of Plato and Descartes has given this superstition an undeservedly long lease of life. And this is what do we think with God and the soul. And so I get the students to first of all take this apart in on their own or in small groups, looking at the language. What does the language mean? What does it imply? What does the words mean? And do you agree with him? Do you think he's fair in what he's saying? And once again, we had a fabulous discussion about this this year. And so we looked at first of all what the words. So it is a savage superstition. The it is bit means dualism. Dualism is the savage superstition. Not Plato and Aris and Plato and Descartes. We know they're not super. Superstitions. We know they're real people. No, the superstition is dualism. Savage. We look at what the word savage means. We look at the dictionary definitions and we talk about what comes to our minds when we think of the word savage. And obviously it's a very um, uh, poetic word. It really does bring forth those ideas and those impressions. I always think of like a savage dog. I think of a savage dog. So you're talking about something very aggressive here. Superstition. We then talk about what is a superstition. Obviously a superstition is something that is unfounded, often a bit illogical, no evidence. We talk about the different superstitions that we have. Um, and so what he's arguing is it's a really bad, negative, wrong superstition or illogical idea to think the body and soul come apart at death. And he says that this isn't helped or mended, but aggravated. And again, what do you think by the word aggravated? What does it make you think of? I think of like aggravated skin that you pick at, you know, that constant irritation there. That's what Plato and Descartes, he argues, is doing with dualism. They're constantly aggravating this confusion. They're keeping it going. And so when he uses the word genius, uh, it could be quite tongue-in-cheek. It's quite, you know, the genius uh, of them um, has given this superstition an undeserving long list. Of, because of Plato and Descartes, this view of body and soul is separate, keeps going and going and going, and has created a superstition not based on any um, uh, knowledge or foundation. In an exam you would not need to write all of that of course but I would pick out the words and use them in your answer. We then bring in his wife, uh, G-E-M Anscombe. I think her first name is Gertrude. If we had Gertrude Elizabeth, don't know if I know the M part of her name. Um, but yes, yeah, so Peter Geach's wife and a woman. We don't come across many women on this course. She argues this, she argues that the bodily act is an act of man qua spirit, the act of a human as a whole. Basically, body and soul go together. You describe your bodily actions, you don't fully describe the why it's doing it. So you can easily describe what your body is doing and how it's working, but not why. The why is the mind part, the why is the soul. So for example, when I was doing this PowerPoint, I was typing this PowerPoint. My fingers were moving over the keys, uh, but that does not explain the action. So that explains the body, but the action, the reason I am typing this because is part of my mind or my soul. So once again, she's saying that they are they work together, they are not separate unities. Um, if you want to use ants come in your essay or anything like that, please don't write the PowerPoint, because obviously you're not typing a PowerPoint, you're writing an essay or whatever it is that you're doing. Further problems with dualism. This is known as the problem of interactionism. How can a spiritual soul and mind influence or direct something that's immaterial, uh, something, sorry, something that's material or physical like the body? How does the soul influence something physical like the body? And how does the physical body influence something like the soul? This is the problem of interactionism. How do they actually interact together? 
clearly it seems that if I hurt my body, my mind feels it as well, such as phantom limbs. So war victims and amputees still feel pain, even though the limb is no longer there. So the pain is in your soul, in your mind, rather than physical, but you still feel it. Or how the mind feels sensations of hunger and thirst when my body needs nourishment. And a good example for that is Siddhartha Gautama. So Siddhartha Gautama was the Buddha. Um, unlike the modern representations of the Buddha as being very, very large, Siddhartha Gautama was actually extraordinarily thin. And he believed in starving the body to reach that full enlightenment, that full, so turning turning off the body, turning off the physical, so the mind is free to explore that enlightenment and full knowledge. And what he realised was, is actually, I need to nourish my body as well as my mind. I need my body to help my mind. Uh, he recognised that after nearly dying, unfortunately, somebody found him. And um, it's always mixed whether it was goat's milk he got or rice, but either way, he was fed and he recognised, actually, I can't, my mind can't do this without my body. Um, but is it still possible to have mind over matter? Can your, is your mind still more in control than your body? Can you still control your body with your mind? So the example there would be something like Darren Brown. Darren Brown, obviously, he's an illusionist, but it still gives you the same idea. Um, he's laid on um, beds of broken glass before, but being able to do something with his mind where he turns off the feelings in his body and someone's actually walked along him. And so again, is it possible with training to turn the mind off from the body? We then bring in our middleman, middleman of Aristotle. He says that the formal cause gives something its shape and nature, and so therefore the body is animated by the soul, which is the formal cause of a human. The soul is the form of the body. The body is the material, the soul is the formal cause of this. The soul does not survive after death. It's not a separate unity. Aristotle wouldn't be a very good empiricist and scientist, would he, if he suddenly believed that the soul exists after we die? No, they both go together. There is no person left. And he gives these three examples. He says that if the eye were the body, its soul would be the capacity to see. Or the axe would be the body, the cutting would be the soul, or a stamp like um, a stamp, like an old fashioned stamper, and the wax. So the stamp would be the physical, the wax impression would be the soul. What he basically means here is that they go hand in hand together. You can't have eye without sight. You can talk about them separately, you can talk about sight, and that will make complete sense. You can talk about eyes, and they would make complete sense talking about them separately, but they go hand in hand together. So you can talk about a body, you can talk about the soul, but they go hand in hand together. So is he a dualist or a monist? Most scholars agree that he is a dualist because he talks about body and soul with separate words, different understandings and different importance and different um, qualities uh, that people do see him as understanding dualism, that there is body and soul. Um, however, what you have to remember is, unlike Plato, he believes that when the body dies, the soul dies as well because they need each other. Peter Geach supports Aristotle, so as he criticised Plato and Descartes, he supports Aristotle by saying the only tenable, tenable meaning reasonable, conception of the soul is the Aristotelian conception of the soul as the form or actual organisation of the living body. So what he's saying there, very straightforward, is that saying that the, the soul is the formal cause, the form in our body, the part that animates the material, that makes sense. And for Aristotle, there is three parts to the soul. Oops, apologies. You have the vegetative. This is the all living things. This is what all living things have. All living things have a vegetative soul. This is for their growth and reproduction. You have the appetitive. This is only animals and humans. These are our desires, urges and emotions. And then finally, intellectual. This is unique to humans. So humans have all three. Animals have two. Uh, plants just have one. And so some people might argue that actually animals show elements of an intellectual, uh, you know, animals can think and reason and remember. So does this mean that they have a more developed soul? Does that mean that they have, again, the same souls of humans? So for Aristotle, though, he believed that animals only had the appetitive and vegetative and that it was intellectual that made humans different, that made humans stand out. 
Aquinas agrees and supports Aristotle. What a surprise. Pretty much all the way through, Aquinas always agrees with Aristotle. When we do Aquinas' teleological and cosmological arguments very shortly, you will see how intertwined the Aristotelian ideas are in his writing and works. He says the soul is defined as the first principle of life in living things, for we call living things animate and those things which have no life inanimate. So what he's saying there is, um, is that living things are animated, they are alive, they are living, and things which have no life are inanimate, they're objects. But the soul is not me, it's just the principle of life, it's my life force, but it's not me, I am not just soul. My life needs the body to be animated, so you actually need to be animated through the body. The soul is not material, but it's necessary for me to be me. And he says this, again, this is in Summa Theologica. It is clear that man is not soul only, but something composed of soul and body. Plato, because he thought that sensation was simply a function of the soul, was able to maintain that man was a soul making use of the body. What he means there is, is because only the soul came with the sensation that was true, so only the soul had the right senses to be able to seek that knowledge, that it was the soul just using, you know, hitching a ride in the body. Whereas for Aquinas, he's saying, no, we're not just the soul, we are soul and body. Once again, even just right in that first bit, it is clear that man is not soul only. Fabulous in an essay, fabulous. You're doing really well, everyone. We are now into our materialists and we bring in, drum roll, Mr. Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins pops up all over this course and he is fabulous. He is extremely outspoken, quite on the rude side, but he's wonderful to get some uh, quality within your essays. He rejects the notion of Plato and Descartes. He even mocks or rejects religious ideas of soul and heaven. Nevertheless, he does acknowledge that there is something, some consciousness. But what he says is that this eventually will be found out through science. Science will find it in our DNA and will find out what this consciousness is. He does distinguish, though, between two types of soul. Soul one is a separate substance. It's the traditional thought. It's the primitive superstition. It's the religious idea. Soul two is the intellectual and spiritual power, the higher development of moral faculties, feelings, and imagination rooted in the body. So soul two is the body, but it's those special parts of the body that do we don't quite know what, where they come from or what they link to. So he's linking that to the soul two idea. But why make this distinction? If he doesn't believe in a soul, why make the distinction at all? He says that he admits there is something there that is more than just evolutionary need for survival, fight or flight. So there is more to humans than just fight for food or fight to stay alive or flight to get away from being eaten. There's more to us than that. We're not that simple. Um, so people have creativity, they have appreciation of literature. So there must be something to recognise these. Uh, that's something he calls soul too, but that will eventually be found by science in our DNA. The final argument is behaviourism from Skinner. Fabulous argument. Very, very interesting is behaviourism. Behaviourism will crop up all over the place. You'll do it in sociology, you'll do it in criminology. And it's by Skinner. It is a type of materialism. It believes that everything, again, is structured by the body. Our thoughts are learnt behaviours. This is not a mind, it's not a soul, it's learnt behaviours. And we learn them through conditioning and reinforcing. So conditioning uh, and reinforcing is when you... Um, positively or negatively reinforce and condition behaviours that you want or don't want. So everything we do is a result of previous learning. So for example, if your actions lead to good results and you're positively reinforced, you are likely to do it again. If your action leads to a bad result or you're negatively or not reinforced at all, you're unlikely to not, so you're unlikely to repeat it again. So it's all to do with reward and punish. And this is very much how we are in society. Think about how you've trained your dog. If you have a dog at home, you give him a treat for something good, you, um, you know, 
send him to a corner or you know you shout at the dog or whatever it might be and they'll think not to do that again and uh, do the same with children they are the naughty step while they're given sweets uh, students have it you know where a teacher might bring in something nice for the students or let them leave a bit earlier not that I've ever done that um, or I'm trying to think of other positive ways I'm such a mean teacher um, but your teachers will have loads of ways of reinforcing I think I'm just a praise person I just give lots of praise uh, but there'll be ways that your teachers reinforce and then obviously things that they don't like you might be sent out of the classroom you might be told off you might have a you know a horrible message home to your parents if you did something they didn't want you to do again so everything is learned behaviors we do this in society what you should and shouldn't do based on um, positive and negative reinforcements if you wear an outfit and you go out and everyone's like oh wow you look fabulous you're more than that you're going to wear it again if you go out and an outfit and people go what are you wearing did you not look in a mirror? What have you done? Chances are that negative reinforcement, again, is you're not going to wear that same outfit twice. And we have two examples here, or two bits of evidence for behaviourism. You do not need to write all of this down in an exam. Please don't. Just use the bits to reinforce what it is that you would like to say. The first is the Watson and Rain study in 1920. Basically, little Albert was a nine-month-old infant who was tested on his reactions to various stimuli. And the little boy had no problems at all. A rat, a rabbit, a monkey, various masks, on the whole, quite happy. They didn't like was the hammer being struck on a steel bar behind his head. Yeah, logically, if someone stood behind me with a steel bar and a hammer and bashed it, I wouldn't be very pleased. And the child would burst into tears. So at 11 months old, uh, um, the little boy was presented with the white rat. Seconds later, the hammer was struck on the steel bar. And this was done seven times over seven weeks. By the end of this, all they had to do was show the white rat and the boy would start to cry even without the bar being hit behind him because he associated the rat with that horrible noise and so the rat alone he was then scared of. This is how your your behaviour can be manipulated and controlled by stimuli that you don't like and affect actually things that you originally did like. Um, this is a lot where phobias come from. Phobias have a logical source behind them but it'll be something negative that you've associated with it or um, you know they tried to do this as a version therapy where something that you liked they tried to then put something horrible that you didn't like like um, they, they did it uh, in homosexual um, uh, case studies and things where if someone was homosexual years ago they used to do a version therapy where they'd make them sick every time looking at some sort of stimuli so they'd associate their feelings towards the same sex with being sick and that had put them off obviously they knew very little about sexuality back then but this is all to do with behaviorism you can control and manipulate it through classical conditioning you can condition somebody his behavior. Pavlov in 1890s um, the Russian psychologist uh, Ivan Pavlov also noticed the salivation in his dogs so he would take his food for his dogs and when the dogs saw the food they would salivate it got to a point where all the dogs would need to do is see him and they would start to salivate even if he didn't have food with him because they associated again him with being fed. Finally, it has been widely attacked as behaviourism for being too reductionist. That uh, Dennett even adds in that Skinner oversimplifies human consciousness. We are not like rats, dogs and pigeons. We cannot be reduced down to treats like give me a paw, here's a treat. We're not that simple. We have far more complex, you know, you might, like I said, you might go out in that outfit and everyone goes, oh, what are you wearing? You might that's great. You know, that might be, you know, even though it's negative reinforcement, you might just like any reinforcement so you might keep wearing the outfit because even though it's negative you like it Skinner would argue that you would stop doing it um, so we are far more complicated human thinking moves beyond Skinner's basic theory and there is something more to human consciousness than something simply explainable like cause and effect that one thing happens because of another thing and again, do you agree? Or is it because we just don't like the idea that we can be so easily controlled? Reduction, um, sorry, behaviourism does argue or does imply that we can be very easily controlled with positive or negative stimuli. Is that true or do we just not like what it might, uh, what the possibilities might have? 
Right, thank you very much for watching everyone. I know this was a long one and as I said, the many, many layers to it, but it's a brilliant one. It really will start stretching your understanding and your knowledge of this topic. Um, if you did like it, don't forget to give me a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss out on a video. And if you have any comments or questions, please post below and I will try and respond. Thank you very much, everyone. Let me just close that. Oops. Sorry, I haven't done a video in a while. Close that one down. Bye for now, everyone.